content carried in here is suitable for general family viewing. afternoon viewers uh, welcome to KUTV Elimu live program uh, I will be a teacher teacher Stapleton Kadi and I will be taking you through integrated science grade 7 so welcome to the class ensure that you have some writing materials whereby you can be able to pick some important points now uh, grade 7 is uh, in the new curriculum that is the CBC curriculum and it happens to be the highest class at the moment so there's no so much into the class now that it is very new and everybody is trying to find their way through the syllabus so today I'm here for integrated science so our main topic for the day will be laboratory apparatus whereby we'll just look at uh, a few we can't discuss all of them in one lesson so there will be always lessons for others but uh, before we cope uh, we come to the main agenda of the lesson uh, it's good to pass through the introductory stages of the lesson so we are looking at grade 7 that is our class and our lesson is uh, integrated science so I want to start by looking at uh, introduction Introduction to Integrated Science. Introduction to Integrated Science. Introduction to Integrated Science. So in our introduction, we are going to see first of all, uh, what is this Integrated Science that uh, we want to talk, to talk about. And uh, from your knowledge about Integrated, is something that is put together. Uh, that might comprise more than one thing. So integrated science, how do we define integrated science? So integrated science is a learning area. Integrated science is a learning area. Integrated science is a learning area. So it must be a learning area because it includes uh, things that we need to know about and that is learning that combines that combines so I've told you from the word integrated it, there must be combination that combines concepts that combines concept of biology combined concepts of biology uh, concepts of physics so we have biology physics, uh, chemistry, chemistry, among others, among others. So, I want us to read what integrated science is, all of us, back at home. Integrated science, so you read together with me, integrated science is a learning area that combines concepts of biology, physics, chemistry, uh, among others so it is a learning area so it is something that is taught so it's a subject that combines the concepts of be of this learning area are driven from biology that is one they're driven from physics that is two they're driven from chemistry apart from the three main subjects we also have among others like you can realize there will be incorporation of concepts from other subjects like environmental studies but the main subjects therefore are biology physics and chemistry so this is where the concepts are borrowed concepts from biology concepts from physics com uh, concepts from chemistry together they are put together and we learn it as integrated science 
So this is taught in junior secondary. But when we reach to senior secondary, this integrated science will now be split into the subjects that now uh, are supposed to be taught. So we'll have biology as a standalone subject, physics a standalone subject, chemistry as a standalone subject. So it is important to describe or to understand what integrated science is. It is also important to understand what is biology uh, made of, what is physics made of, and what is chemistry made of. So uh, what is biology? If we define biology in very simple terms as uh, a, grade, a grade seven pupils. So biology is the study of living things. This is the study of living things. Biology is the study of living things. So if you're asked in exams, that is a possibility. What is biology? This is the study of living things. When you talk about living things, you're talking about things that have life. And the things that have life here are two. Uh, they can either be plants or animals. So the living things here are plants and animals. If you're a living thing, you're either a plant or an animal. Uh, let's look at uh, chemistry. What is chemistry? Uh, what is chemistry? Define part B. Chemistry. So at home, maybe in your own, you can try to define it in your own way. Maybe a second for that. Uh, chemistry can be defined as the study of matter and its properties. So chemistry can be defined as the study of matter and uh, its properties. So this is a study that will deal with matter basically and its properties. So you realize our definitions are simplified. They are not, maybe they might slightly differ with those of senior secondary. This is just junior secondary. So we look at uh, the third definition. Uh, we look at the third definition, which is physics. So maybe I'll give you a second to define what physics is in your, in your own way. So it is the study of matter and its relation to energy. The study of matter and its relation to energy. So these are the three main subjects or study areas that combine together to form integrated science, which we have biology, chemistry, and physics. Biology, let's read with you. It is the study of living things, and the living things are plants and animals. Chemistry, the study of matter and its properties. So we have matter here and the properties of matter. Then physics, the study of matter, but this time now it's not relation to its properties as chemistry. It is matter and, the, and its relation to energy, and its relation to energy. So those are the three main uh, areas where we derive our concepts from in integrated science. Now, having learned about that, we are still in the introductory stages. We can look at uh, career opportunities. Career opportunities. Career opportunities. Career opportunities. These career opportunities, these are the career paths that one is likely to engage in or is likely to be when they have finished or they have completed uh, this integrated science. So the career opportunities are very wide. They, we can list as many career opportunities as possible, but just to list a few, uh, a few without listing everything. So uh, integrated science can lead one to be a medical doctor. Uh, it can lead one to be a pharmacist. Uh, it can lead one to be a teacher, like myself, I'm a teacher, and uh, I'm teaching integrated science. Uh, it can lead one to be a farmer. There are things that will be discussed that will be very relevant to a farmer. Uh, we have things like engineer. So out of integrated science, you can also be an engineer. So these are just five 
uh, to cover for the many career opportunities that one can uh, develop in relation to integrated science. Maybe back at home you can add uh, a list of five more. So I challenge you to go ahead and uh, name at least 10 career opportunities. So you can use the textbooks if you have some. You can as well use the internet, you can Google some so that you know you can exhaust, there are so many. So we have defined what integrated sciences. We have looked at the career op op opportunities that you can have in relation to integrated science. Now, the last bit of the introductory uh, thing that we are want to talk about is um, pathways. So there's something we call pathways to integrated science. Pathways to integrated science. So pathways mean when you study integrated science, you can end up in three directions. So we have the first one, the second one, and the third one. So there are three pathways that are involved in the integrated science. Now, one of the pathways is social sciences. We can have a pathway called social sciences. We can have a pathway called arts and sports sciences. We can also have a pathway called science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in brackets STEM. So when, we, when you learn this integrated science as a subject in junior secondary school, when you go to senior secondary school, you are likely to major in one, two, or both of these sciences. These are sciences that we have uh, discussed. Now, after senior secondary, that's now where you go back, you go now to a uh, university. And in the university now, this is the pathways you're likely to take. So if you want to, if you want to major in the sciences, so you can deal with what we call social sciences. That is the first one. You can also look at arts and sports sciences. Then the third one, you can also look at uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So let's look what are these things entailed of. So we start with the first pathway. And the first pathway I've told you is called social sciences. So social sciences as the first pathway deals with the two areas that you're likely to major in. The first one is language and literature. Language and literature. That is the first social science. The second social science is humanities. Humanities and business studies. Humanities and business studies. So that is the first pathway whereby it's called social sciences. This is still a science. So under social sciences, maybe at the university, you can decide to do language and literature. You can also decide to do humanities and business studies. So we go to number two. Uh, the second one, you can decide to do arts. Uh, you can decide to do arts and sport sciences. Arts and sport sciences. Now, under arts and sports sciences, you can decide to do one as sports science. You can decide one as sports sciences. Sports science. Then uh, we can also have visual arts. We can also have visual arts. And the third one, we can have performing arts. We can have performing arts. So these are under arts and sport sciences. The last path that you can have, we are still in the introductory stages. I need you to understand first what you are learning before we can go to what exactly you want to learn today. So the third and the final uh, pathway that you can, you can take uh, through is called science. That's number three. Science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And mathematics. So this is called science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. 
and it is abbreviated as stem it's abbreviated as stem s standing for science t standing for technology e standing for engineering and m standing for mathematics so let's look at what this stem entails so it also has some things that are found there uh, we can have applied sciences our applied science can have applied science we can have pure science we can have pure science uh, apart from applied science and pure science we can have technology and engineering technology and engineering can have technology and engineering apart from technology and engineering we can have uh, the last one apart from technology and engineering we can have career career and technology studies career and technology studies those are our three areas that we can find so let me take you through once again these are pathways to integrated science and the pathways these are the things that you can do when you go through uh, this integrated science we have already looked at the career opportunities so the career opportunities will be based on the pathways for example if you do social sciences it will lead into one of the career opportunities that you have discussed there if you do arts and sports sciences it will also lead you to one of the career opportunities that you have discussed then if you do social uh, science technology engineering and mathematics as well so in the social sciences here we have two main areas which is language and literature uh, you can decide to do language and literature as a subject you can have for example english and literature that is a uh, one we can have humanities and business studies then arts and sports sciences so you can do what you call sports sciences that is purely about sports visual arts and performing arts there's a slight difference between the visual arts and the performing arts here we can have things like uh, music and drama you can have uh, things like acrobatics so for example acrobatics will be under performing arts those are things that you need to perform visual arts maybe things to do with drama those are just but a few examples then we have the stem uh, we've given it as stem this stands for science technology engineering and mathematics so here we are going to look at applied science as one area pure science as another area technology and engineering and then finally we are going to look at career and technology studies now uh, that is part of our introduction in relation to integrated science it was a very important session because you need to know what what are we learning at the end of the day so that is the subject now that it's a very new subject that is what you need to know at first so it is a science but it is cooperating all the other areas of science and it has different career paths and the career paths will lead to three pathways and the pathways we have already discussed so the main agenda of a business uh, will be laboratory apparatus and instruments laboratory apparatus and instruments laboratory apparatus and instruments so in the laboratory we have apparatus that we need to do uh, a laboratory is just a room whereby we can have our experiments done the many experiments that we do are in junior secondary and senior secondary unlike in primary in primary most of the experiments that were done were done using locally available materials and those are the things we could do in our classes but when you grow uh, you go higher and you reach to a junior secondary there are things that you need to do in the laboratory so a laboratory is just a room whereby you keep the equipment and apparatus you need for the different experiments and you also do the experiments there so the apparatus are the things that you're going to use and the reagents that you're going to use in your experiments are the chemicals and 
what have you so we want to look at the laboratory apparatus and instruments so if you are noting you can write laboratory apparatus and instruments laboratory apparatus and instruments so i've already told you what a laboratory is it is a room whereby chemicals are stored to be used in experiments and also experiments are done so uh, we can look at apparatus what are apparatus for instance apparatus because we are talking about apparatus and instruments so what are apparatus for example if i ask you what are apparatus so in one second can you try at home these are set of equipment used by scientists these are set of equipment used by scientists so what are apparatus let's all say from home apparatus these are set of equipment used by scientists when you talk about scientists this should not be a heavy word to scare you when you are learning science and you're carrying out the experiment at that stage in time you're a scientist you're just a young scientist who might grow and become a very big scientist and discover things that were never discovered before so that is an apparatus so it is a set of an equipment an apparatus must be an equipment and an equipment is something that you can hold something that you can see that is an apparatus let's look at what is an instrument the instrument uh you see your own words you have one second to try what an instrument is and an instrument is a tool or implement used for precision work a tool or an implement a tool or an imp implement used for precision precision work so we have two things here because we want to learn about laboratory apparatus and instrument so we have defined what an apparatus is this is an equipment that is used by the scientists to do the experiments and an instrument is a tool or an implement used for the precision work the precision work is just something that you want to do in the laboratory now this laboratory apparatus and equipment they are usually made of two main materials uh what are these two main materials maybe at home you can try and guess okay i believe that the answers you gave it's either glass or plastic so the materials the materials here can either be two we can either have glass we can either have plastic so whether it's glass or plastic one common thing between all materials whether it's made of glass or it's plastic it is clear now the choice of the material which can either be glass or plastic is based on important aspects now number one i have said it must be clear why do you think the apparatus that we use have to be clear the apparatus have to be clear so that they are visible because there are things we put in the apparatus for example we have an apparatus called a test tube and i can put a chemical inside and heat the chemical and see the things that happen for example i'm likely to see the color of the fume that that chemical is going to produce so if my apparatus was colored if i had a, a glass test tube that is green in color and the chemical produces a green flame will i be able to see the green flame i believe your answer is no so number one, they are clear for visibility now number two, they are made of either plastic or glass because plastic and glass does not react to most of the chemicals that you are going to use in the laboratory if we have other materials for example wood you might find that uh, some chemicals are very corrosive when it comes to wood and they are going to interfere with that specific apparatus so it is for that reason now 
that we either use uh, glass or plastic. They are also uh, used uh, glass or plastic and they are clear so that we are able to see the, the readings and the calibrations. For example, I can have this an instrument called a beaker. I can have a beaker here and it will have some markings that I need to observe. For example, if I put a liquid in my beaker, I need to know what is the measurement of the liquid. So I'm explaining the reasons why we use glass and plastic that are clear. So those are the two reasons why we use glass and plastic. Now, apparatus to be used in the laboratory can be grouped as follows. Apparatus to be used in the laboratory can be grouped as follows. So let's, let's look at the apparatus. How can we group the apparatus to be used in the laboratory? So in your own imagination, maybe you can start gazing at home while I'm clearing this board of mine. So what do you think are some of the apparatus that we need? So one of the apparatus, so apparatus are grouped as follows. Apparatus are grouped as follows. Apparatus are grouped as follows. So these apparatus that I've told you, they are either made of plastic or they are made of glass. They can be grouped as follows. The first one will be apparatus for heating. Apparatus for heating. That is the first category. The second category will be apparatus for magnification. Apparatus for magnification. Point number three will be apparatus for measuring temperature. Apparatus for measuring temperature. There will be apparatus for measuring temperature. Number four, we'll have apparatus for measuring weight. Apparatus for measuring weight. We'll have apparatus for measuring weight. Number five, we'll have apparatus for measuring length. Apparatus for measuring length apparatus for measuring length number six we'll have apparatus for measuring mass apparatus for measuring mass number seven uh, we can have a category of apparatus for measuring volume Apparatus for measuring. Apparatus for measuring volume. So when we look at these categories, these are the categories of apparatus that we have in our grade seven uh, school laboratory. So we can have apparatus for heating. In case you want to do any heating in the laboratory, you don't carry anything into the lab. There are specific apparatus for that. We can have apparatus for magnification. Uh, to magnify something is to increase the size of that specific thing so that it can be bigger. Like if you want to observe very tiny or very small things, you put it in magnification and you'll be able to see. So we have apparatus specifically for magnification. We also have apparatus for measuring temperature. You realize that temperature uh, needs to be measured. Not only the temperature of a person. You can have to measure temperature of liquids and many others. We also have apparatus for measuring weight that can be used. We can also have apparatus for measuring the length. We can also have apparatus for measuring the mass. And we can also have apparatus for measuring volume. So we cannot discuss all these apparatus in one lesson. 
but we can discuss maybe one or two at most. So, our today's uh, discussion, we want to look at apparatus for heating. Apparatus for heating. Apparatus for heating. So, when you talk about apparatus for heating, these are apparatus that we use in the laboratory and the main purpose of using these apparatus is to produce the heat. Now, in the laboratory, there are many experiments that are done and most of the experiments will need heating. So, whatever will need heating will be done and there must be heat that is provided. And it's not like at home whereby maybe you can have uh, the three stones put firewood and then heat no or maybe you take a gas cooker to the laboratory that is not what happens so we have specific apparatus that you can be used to heat and the and the apparatus number one they are not very heavy in the first place they are portable you can easily carry from one place to another the other thing is that the flame that they produce is not too much it's just enough that can be used for that specific uh, heating that you want to do. And then they are available so that they can also be found. So apparatus for heating, the first apparatus that we look at is called a spirit lamp. The first apparatus is called a spirit lamp. So a spirit lamp, I'm just giving a rough drawing of what a spirit lamp looks like. So that is a spirit lamp. So you'll have the wick. And then you'll have your spirit here. This is a spirit lamp. You'll have your spirit inside here. And then this is a wick. Or utambi. Then this is your spirit that is used to burn and then the flame the flame will be produced so if I want to use it to heat uh, that is the first apparatus that I will use and the apparatus is called a spirit lamp and in the spirit lamp we'll have a wick we'll have the spirit and it's used it uses the spirit to light so when I want to use it to heat we also have stands that we use to place anything that you want to heat. So we'll have the stands that we'll use. When you want to heat something, you put it on the stand, and then under the stand, you put what you call a spirit lamp. Uh, we have the second one, which is very common, and we have all seen it. It's called a candle. A candle is also used for heating in the laboratory. So we have many candles, different types of candles. And uh, these candles can be used at home. It's the same candle that is used at home. So this is your flame. Now you realize that the candle produces some heat that is not too much. So we can have it when you want to heat uh, things that don't need so much flame. So this is a candle, it's just the normal candle that we use at home. Probably when there's no power or if you use it throughout. Uh, the third one is called a stove. So a stove, we have a specific stove that can be used and it's used in uh, our homes. But the one that is used for, for the home is not the specific one that is used in the laboratory. That is called a stove. And then the fourth one, and the most important one, is called a Bunsen burner. This one is called a Bunsen burner. And a Bunsen burner is a type of apparatus that is used for heating at home. So the diagram of a Bunsen burner will be something like this. Growing a Bunsen burner. This is the diagram of a Bunsen burner. Try 
trying to draw what we call a Bunsen burner. So this is an example of what you call a Bunsen burner. A Bunsen burner. So a Bunsen burner is a very important apparatus in the laboratory that uh, we all need to understand how it works. We all need uh, to see the diagram and we need to label the diagram. So the flame usually comes out through this part. So we can have our flame there. So if we label a Bunsen burner, we look at this part. This part is called collar. That part is called collar. So we just, uh, sorry, that is called the chimney. That is called the chimney. The collar is right here, collar. So we mention the parts first, then we look at the functions of the parts later. This is called air hole. This is called air hole. This is called jet. That is a jet. Uh, this is called a rubber tube. That is called a rubber tube. And this is called the base. The base. So if, if our lesson was taking place in the laboratory, I could be able to show you. When I say chimney, I will be able to show you. This is a chimney, a collar. This is a collar, an air hole. This is an air hole, jet, rubber tube, and the base. So we'll be able to see all of them. But uh, nevertheless, we can look at the diagram and still understand what all these things are. So those are the functions. Uh, those are the parts. So we look at the function. What is the importance of which function? Why do we call it chimney? Why do we call it collar? Why do we call it air hole? Why do we call it a jet, a base? And what function does it serve when it comes to this Bunsen burner? So those are the main parts of a Bunsen burner. And now we look at the parts. So parts of a Bunsen burner. We look at parts of a Bunsen burner. Parts of a Bunsen burner. That is what you want to look at. And the first part is called a chimney. Chimney. So when I write the chimney, I take you back to where the chimney is. So this is the chimney that runs from this part up to down here. That is what you call a chimney. And it's metallic in shape. So it is a hollow metallic cylinder. It is a hollow metallic cylinder with an air hole with an air hole when i say it is metallic hollow metallic simply means made of metal hollow means it has a hole so something that has a hole through it is called hollow so uh in a chimney this is where the laboratory gas, this is where the laboratory gas and air, laboratory gas and air mix to produce a flame. Mix to produce a flame. So when you look at the chimney, this one being the chimney, this is where the laboratory gas the laboratory gas is the gas that is inside the laboratory and it's used for heating. So this is where the laboratory gas coming from the jet, the jet is here, gets into the chimney together with the air. We'll understand where the air is coming from. And when the two do that, they're able to produce a flame. So that is the function of the chimney. Let's look at air hole. Air hole. 
So the air hole, I take you back to my diagram. This is the air hole. I take you back to the diagram. This is the air hole. And a, a air hole is just a small opening. Inside in the chimney, the chimney is that big metallic thing. That big metallic thing has a space that allows in air. And that space here, the, the, the diagram is very clear. We can all see that small space is what you call an air hole. So let's look uh, what an air hole is. It is a small hole, a small hole that allows in air and the air that we're talking about here is oxygen allows in air into the chimney allows in air into the chimney <coughs> sorry allows in air into the chimney so this is the air hole it's a very small hole that allows in air and the air here is oxygen into the chimney so when you are using the Bunsen burner, you can either decide to allow in air or not to allow in air. So when I allow in air, I'm going to use an air hole. So an air hole in our diagram, which is very clear, you can see, is the one that allows in air. And the air that I'm talking about here is none other than oxygen. We go on to the collar. We look at the collar in our chimney that is also there. So collar, that is uh, part number C. So we look at C, which is collar. So I take you back to the diagram. This is the collar here. Now this collar is something that can be rotated. It looks more or less like a, like a screw or like a bottle top, how the bottle top can move in and out. So a collar is a metal, a metal ring. A collar is a metal ring that controls the air that gets into the chimney. It is a metal ring that controls the air that gets into the chimney. Now, back to our main diagram. If you look uh, at our main diagram, I hope you've drawn or you can look at it if you have a book. Now, the collar is right here, and I've said it's a metal ring. I believe all of us can see the diagram clearly in our screen. So I'm going to point what I'm explaining. The collar is right here. And this is a metal that can be moved up and can be moved down. So we have our air hole here. And I have said clearly that the, the collar is a metal ring. And this metal ring is used to control the air that gets into the air hole. So if I, if I loosen the, met, the collar up to the air hole, it's going to close the air hole. When it closes the air hole, there is no air that is going to get in. So for instance, if I put here the collar, still looking at our main diagram, if I put here the collar, I've drawn with a black pen so that you see the difference. If I put my collar there, and then I've removed it from this part, if I've removed the collar from that part, it means the collar that is right here has blocked air, and there is no air getting into the chimney. So that's what it does. I can as well remove the collar, from the air hole and put it where it was. So I can as well remove it here and put it where it was. So if I remove it here, if I remove it there, I'm going to remain with my air hole and the air hole will be open. So the main function of the collar is to control the air that gets in into the chimney. How does it control the air? It controls the air by either covering the hole or leaving the hole open. So when it covers the hole, we are going to understand just in uh, some few steps next, we are going to understand why do we need to close the, the hole or why do we need to open the hole? So opening and closing the hole is 
as a result of the collar. So we're going to see if we open the hole, something is going to happen to the Bunsen burner. And if, if I open the hole, something again is going to happen to the Bunsen burner. And that is the function of the collar. So we go to the next, which is a jet. That is our D, jet. So what is the function of the jet? Let me take you back to my diagram, the original diagram. And a jet is this small part here. It has a very tiny hole. And the function of the jet, if you can see, the jet is down here. Just now next to the air hole. So the jet injects the laboratory gas into the chimney. I see you can see it very well. So this is through, this is where the laboratory gas passes through. Some people tend to confuse jet and air hole. Air hole is for passage of oxygen and jet is the passage of the laboratory gas. So if, if I need the laboratory gas of which must take place, the laboratory gas gets through the, the jet. I hope you've understood. So the jet allows the laboratory the laboratory gas into the chimney the jet allows the laboratory gas into the chimney that is the function of the jet it allows the laboratory gas into the chimney and i've demonstrated how that happens we look at uh, the rubber tube rubber tube Look at our rubber tube. So, I take you back to the diagram as well so that you are able to see what the rubber tube is. I take you back to the diagram. Now, the rubber tube, uh, this is the rubber tube. Uh, I want to relate this rubber tube to those who have uh, cookers at home and those who have the gas cylinders. We have a tube, this is the, this tube. It's made of rubber. That's why we call it a rubber tube. So those who have the cookers at home, or if you've ever seen a cooker, we have a rubber that connects the gas to the cooker, if you're using a cooker. And the rubber tubes are come of different colors. We have yellow, blue. So that is the same rubber tube that we use. So if I'm using a cooker at home, where I have the cooker, I will connect it to the gas. Whatever takes the gas to the cooker is this what you call rubber tube. So in the same case in the Bunsen burner, we have a rubber tube that now collects or connects the Bunsen burner to the source of the gas. So it is fixed to the external source of the gas. Rubber tube, it is, it is fixed to the external to the external source of the laboratory gas. It's fixed to the external source of the laboratory gas. So the rubber tube must be fixed to where we have the laboratory gas. So that's why it brings in, it brings in the laboratory gas to the tube, to the jet, then to the chimney. And as, as earlier we said, the chimney, it's where the laboratory gas mixes with the air. We come to the final thing in the Bunsen burner which is called the base. Base. To our diagram, if we look at our main diagram, this is what you call the base here. And uh, this base, this one here, this is what you call the base. It's made of thick mass uh, metal. It's made of thick metal. You can see my base here. It's metallic in nature, and it's a very strong thing. The purpose of the base, you can see, it is wider. It is wider, you can see the width. It's wider than the whole Bunsen burner. That is what the base is. So having looked at the base, we can now state the function. It is a metallic, it's made of metallic material. It's made of metallic material. And it's used to support, it's used to support the Bunsen burner. It's used to support the Bunsen burner. So that is the base. So we have looked at uh, 
We have looked at the functions and the parts of a Bunsen burner. We have stated the parts. We have stated the functions. So we just have one very minor thing, very small, very small, not minor as such, but very small in a Bunsen burner that comes as a result of opening and closing of the air hole. Now, in our earlier uh, writings, we have written that the collar is used either to open or close the air hole. So when we open or close the air hole, we are likely to get two different types of flames. Remember a flame is whatever is produced here. This is what you call a flame. So if I use the collar to close the air hole, I'm going to get a type of a flame and if I leave the air hole open, I'm going to get a different type of flame. So flames produced by a Bunsen burner are two types of flames. The first uh, type of flame is called luminous flame. Can you repeat after me? Luminous flame. Now, luminous flame is a type of a flame that is produced when the air hole is closed. You have to understand that. Luminous flame is produced when the air hole is closed. So for us to close the air hole, we take the collar where we have the air hole and we close it. So when I close the air hole here, the flame that I'm going to see here is going to be luminous. And luminous flame, how am I going to see this is a luminous flame? Luminous flame is yellow in color. And it is used for lighting instead of burning. When I leave the air hole open, as it is in the diagram, I'm going to produce a flame called non-luminous flame. And non-luminous flame is blue in color. And non-luminous flame is mainly used for heating. So if I want to heat, I ask a question there at home. If I want to heat something in uh, using a Bunsen burner, which flame do I use? If I want to heat something with a Bunsen burner, which flame do I use? Now, I assume if you give a correct answer, then the correct answer is supposed to be non luminous uh, i asked another question which flame is produced when the air hole is closed and what color is it which flame is produced when the air hole is closed and what color is it so i believe your answer is the type of the flame is uh, luminous and the color is yellow so if you said that you got it right so let's note that down flames produced by a Bunsen burner. Flames produced by a Bunsen burner. So we give the first one called luminous flame. Luminous flame. And we have said luminous flame is produced when the air hole is closed. Produced when the air hole is closed produced when the air hole is closed. Uh, it is yellow in color. It's yellow in color. Then it's used for lighting rather than heating. We look at non-luminous flame non-luminous flame i've already explained all this non-luminous flame i'm just putting it in writing for better understanding so it is the opposite of this produced when the air hole is open produced when the air hole is open then it is blue in color blue in color and it's used for heating it's used for heating those are the two types of flames that are produced so having looked at uh, the three types of flames i come to the end of the lesson that was about uh, laboratory apparatus now before i conclude my lesson i would like 
to pass through the lesson in summary or in brief of what I have taught today and what you have learned. So in case you joined the lesson late, a little bit late, or you did not understand somewhere, this is the time now maybe to catch up. So we start by looking at integration science. We first of all started by defining and we said it is a combination or it borrows concepts from other subjects. And we looked at three main subjects which are biology, chemistry, and physics. Whereby we defined what is biology, what is physics, and what is chemistry. And we said biology is the study of living things. And we talked about living things as plants and animals. After looking at the definition of all those subjects, we also looked at the career opportunities. So we said the career opportunities are so many. You can be a doctor, you can be an engineer, you can be a teacher, like teacher Stapleton, teaching integrated science in KU TV. Uh, we also talked about pathways, and we said we have three pathways that when you study integrated science, you can go to other pathways where we had social sciences, which included languages and literature. We also have humanities and business studies that is under social sciences. We looked at arts and sports, where we talked about sports science, performing arts and visual arts. Then the third and the last pathway was STEM, studying science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And we had pure sciences, applied sciences, technology, and engineering then career and technological studies. Then finally, we looked at laboratory apparatus. We defined what is an apparator, what is an instrument. Then we looked at the different categories of apparatus. We looked at seven, just to mention one or two, apparatus for heating, for magnifying, for measuring mass, temperature, volume, etc. But our main focus was on apparatus for heating in this lesson. And we looked at four, we looked at a spirit lamp, we looked at a candle, we looked at a stove, and our main focus was on a Bunsen burner. And the Bunsen burner has the following parts. It has a chimney, it has a collar, it has an air hole, it has a jet, it has a rubber tube, and it has a base. And a Bunsen burner produces two types of flames. We have luminous flame and non-luminous flame. Luminous flame is produced when the air hole is closed, and it's yellow in color. Whereas non-luminous is produced when the air hole is open and it's blue in color. And non-luminous flame is used for heating. And that is what our lesson was based on. So I believe that you have enjoyed the lesson. And apart from enjoying the lesson, you have also gained much in integrated science. So see you next time. Maybe we look at other apparatus that are also in our junior secondary laboratory. So from me, Teacher Stapleton, uh, through our very beautiful station that reaches us with this kind of knowledge, KUTV, much appreciation to the station, and I wish you a very good evening back at home. See you some other time.